Back in 1980, I designed the game Call of Cthulhu. And one of the more obvious jobs I had was to organize and plan out the various monsters. But see, Lovecraft never organized his critters in any kind of formal fashion. I mean, the head guys were like the great old ones. That's not even a name, that's such a description. Most of his monsters don't have actual names. For example, Deep Ones? The Star Vampire? I made that name up. It wasn't even called that in the story. Fungi from Yugoth? Old Ones? Elder Things? Server of the Outer Gods? Another one I had to just make up. At least the word Old One appears. Star Spawn? Serpent Folk? The Great Race? These aren't names. These are definitions. The Serpent One wouldn't call themselves Serpent Folk. Right? Deep Ones speak vocally. I guarantee that their name for themselves isn't Deep One any more than our word for humans is Featherless Biped. The Old Ones had a weird whistling form of communication when they're in an atmosphere. They probably had some non-audible means of communication in space, but they wouldn't have called themselves Old Ones with either type of speech, even translated into English. They're not Old Ones to themselves. They're just whatever they are. So one of my first challenges in creating Call of Cthulhu was that the monsters, by and large, didn't have names. My next problem was that I needed a bunch of different monsters. Lovecraft didn't name the monsters, and he didn't describe them. He just showed them off in bits and pieces. His most carefully described and detailed monsters are often rare or happenstance entities. For example, in The Lurking Fear, there's cannibal monsters underground, but they're not a, a race or a species. They're just this one family, the Martens, that became cannibal monsters. And Wilbur Waitley's really famous, but he's unique. There's one Wilbur Waitley ever. I can't have a game in which every creature is custom designed to carry the scenario, like The Lurking Fear or The Dunwich Horror. I mean, I guess I could, I mean, it just doesn't work. I can't populate my game with those. You can have those in the game, but that's not what I needed. So here is my dark secret. I basically had to invent a lot of the monsters in Call of Cthulhu. Now, these monsters are not completely my own creations from scratch. I tried to fit them into Lovecraft's universe, but often all I had to work with was a terse description or sentence fragments. Let's take the Dimensional Shambler as an example. Lovecraft, in his rewrite of Horror in the Museum, at one point has his villain say, Coward, you can never face the dimensional shambler whose hide I put on to scare you. The mere sight of it alive, or even the full-fledged thought of it, would kill you instantly with fright. It's obviously not true that the name of the skinned monster is Dimensional Shambler. That's just what the villain describes it as. But I had nothing else to go on. I also didn't have any abilities or powers for it. We don't even see the thing in the name in the in the book. We just have a skin. So I had to invent its abilities going off the name. Since then, this shambler, which I essentially created from whole cloth, has been used in all sorts of sources. From this nubbin, which essentially consists of it's scary and Roger says Dimensional Shambler. I had to invent a whole background for it, stats for it, abilities. I later used it in the Quake game for a pretty cool monster. My next video is going to be about the Shambler, so wait for that. We'll talk more about it. I also had to invent many or, you know, most other creatures again. Now, each has some slight basis in an offhand of Remark of Lovecraft. Sometimes I combined it with something else. So, for example, in the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, Lovecraft says that Nyarlathotep's formless hunting horrors are seared into dust by sunlight. So look, a term I can use, hunting horror. I admit, I ignored Lovecraft's mention that they are formless, I have enough blob monsters, but in some stories by August Derleth, he mentions flying snake-like beings with one or more rotating wings, and I decreed that these limbless flying worms, which are only seen at a distance through a, like, a palantir, basically, would be the hunting horror, and I described them. So part of the idea behind them, thanks to uh, Derleth's influence and the fact that Lovecraft has them flying, is they have various numbers of wings. Now, I've created figures, and I've got rules describing these entities, which are basically a combination of a, a brief sighting in a Durleth tale, a pair of words coined by Lovecraft, and my own additions to make it useful in a game. 
We're going to talk about more of the now standard monsters that people use in all kinds of, of stories and even movies and books that are supposed to be part of Lovecraft's mythos that a lot of people don't know I invented. Let's talk about some of them. The Dark Young. This might be my, my most successful uh, entity. So I needed to have a creature that worked for Shubnigrath besides just her. And um, there was a story by uh, Robert Block, uh, a manuscript find in a deserted house, which mentioned a tree-like thing that was probably a Shoggoth. But uh, but I knew Shoggoths didn't look like trees. So I took this tree-like thing and said, what would a tree-like thing be like? It had hoofs and lips. And, I, and basically, I made the Dark Young up out of that. And it became a really popular monster. It appears in uh, uh, Quake as a Shub Niggerath. It appears in all kinds of games. It, uh, I think a lot of people think that the Dark Young is something. That he didn't even use the word Dark Young together. I made up the name. I made up the description. Everything about it is mine. But it has fit really well into Lovecraft's mythology. Another thing is that the creature, a satyr, is mentioned very briefly in a couple of Lovecraft stories and a couple of Frank Belknap Long stories. Um, the, the satyrs will help the, the hounds of Tindalos break through, that kind of thing, but you never see a satyr. Well, I created the satyr out of the descrip various descriptions. I basically said, I don't think Lovecraft believes in satyrs. What could these be? Um, and my assumption was that in a lot of Lovecraft stories, it's clear that humans tend to genetically mutate or devolve pretty easily. You have um, them devolving into ghouls. You have them devolving into deep ones. You have the Martens clan from the Lurking Fear that devolves into something awful. You have the, the humans, that the degenerate humans from the rats in the walls. Uh, the, the, even the one where the beast in the cave, like he wrote that when he was 16 and he had a devolved human. Um, so I decided that these devolved or mutated or bestial humans would be the satyrs. And, so, and there's other stories I can get from them, but that's that. So then we have a great old one that I invented, or maybe it's an outer guard. It's hard to say, Gobo Gig. So what happened with this is that at the end of the Cthulhu Wars project, um, I was uh, encouraged to add a new great old one that was made up by me and I didn't want to do it. And uh, I put a, a poll out to the, uh, not a poll, but a question out to the people back in the, the, the game. It says, do you want me to do a great old one that I make up? And they did. And so I said, okay, well, we're going to call it Gobo Gig. And um, I'll get into why that was in a minute. But I said, I want to connect it to something. So what I connected it to was uh, at the end of the Mountains of Madness, we have the guy looking out of the plane, seeing past the the old the old one city into the hills beyond and he goes mad he says the formless blob the proto shagas the moon ladder the the all these things so i said what could this be and so what i posited was that we know that according to lovecraft lore and at one time scientific lore that the way the moon was formed is that the earth shot off um a big chunk of itself to become the moon. That's where the Pacific Ocean was. That's the idea, right? Who knows how the moon got formed? That was one idea, okay? So I said, this is how the moon was formed. And Gobogeg is the entity, it's the moon ladder, which is how a part of the earth shoots off to become a moon. And so it is up there in the hills past the old one city. And when it comes to fruition, it will break off all Antarctica into a globe and spin away from the earth and become a new moon. And then Gobogeg will be the ruler of that moon. Of course, all life on Earth will be destroyed by this happening. I mean, by the crust will melt, you know, but that's it is. So Gobogeg is a great old one who doesn't exist yet. But when he appears, the world is destroyed quite quickly. We have the Athens uh, that I created for uh, Cthulhu Wars uh, and other, and Sandy Peters is Cthulhu Mythos. So the Athens are from Lovecraft's uh, story where he says that there was the red lit caverns of Yoth, which have extinct reptilian things. Now, I think some people like to think of these reptilian things as serpent men, but they seemed creepier than that to me. So I made them into these other entities. We have the Vunith. All Lovecraft says is, is in his story is that it's, in the Dreamlands, it's an amphibious horror. So I thought, amphibious horror, where can we? I don't want it to just be a crocodile. Crocodiles are fine. So what I based it on was was um, some limbless salamander things, you know, with uh, that have to be scary. We have Lovecraft say the Nori, which are bearded entities that build labyrinths. I've made a whole background and a history and a culture for the Nori, which you can see in Sandy Peters' Cthulhu Mythos. Lovecraft mentions Wamp. He says the red-footed Wamps that live in dead cities and, and eat corpses that keep the ghouls out. Well, he doesn't say what they look like. 
But Clark Ashton Smith had a story where this awful thing appears. It's the abominations of Yondo. At the end of it, this thing comes it's so terrifying that the hero just runs for it. And he goes back to be tortured to death rather than face this thing. So I said, that thing is going to be the Wamps. And it is. There's a lot of stories that talk about the library at Kaleno. Which has, uh, which, and the mission, the library in Hyterford is. So, what I said, I want to have the library and I want it to be something that's so creepy he can make Cthulhu give back an overdue book. So, I made the librarian and then I wanted to have a custodian for the, for the map I put him in. And the custodian, the idea behind him, which I taught my artists and I work together is that it's actually kind of like a pill bug or just a small, like scavenger beetle, but that it's living in the, in the library of Kleno or near Olden, so it's eating like the droppings of the Elder Gods. So it keeps getting stronger, more magical, and bigger and scarier until it's finally this terrifying monster and is based on his diet. So it's now the Kastonian. Then uh, I have another trio, which is the Outer Mutant, the Outer Abomination, and the Outer Spawn. And if you look at them, you have the Mutant that evolves into the Abomination, which evolves into the Spawn. And these are, of course, based on Wilbur Waitley and the story of the Dunwich Horror. And Wilbur is supposed to be the Mutant, and Wilbur's brother, Junior Waitley, is going to be the Outer Spawn. The Abomination is a posited intermediate. And... Uh, the, bomb, the spawn is supposed to eventually evolve into a godlike thing, it seems, in the story to destroy the world. And Wilbur Waitley says that when the world's cleared off, he'll change and evolve. So I wanted to have these things be able to evolve and get stronger and stronger and cause trouble. So I have, I had to make up the names because they aren't ever called mutants or spawns in the book. But I needed a name, spawn, abomination, mutant. Okay. We have the servitor of the outer gods. Uh, so this thing shows up in a couple stories, sort of, where he says there's these things with tentacles that play flutes that are near Azathoth or other creatures, and they're always described as pretty scary and terrible, but they don't do anything except play the flute when they're seen. But usually they're dismissed really fast because they're too much. So I had to get, I made up the name Servitor of the Outer Gods. I know, right? And uh, and put him in and gave him a, a personality and a the and a and a four. And now it gives you an extra monster. If you want to face off Azathoth or someone like that, now you have a monster you can deal with that won't instantly kill you because it's you know it's only a server of outer god, not the outer god. And finally, even the Lang spiders I had to create because um, Lovecraft says there's giant purple spiders on the plateau of Lang, which which fight wars with or fight with the uh, people of Lang, the men of Lang. But Lovecraft never sees the spider, never talk, he just, he, all he shows is a mural of the guys fighting the spider. So maybe there's not really spiders, who knows? But I said, I said, there's real spiders. I wanted to have them be like spiders. They don't have a civilization. They're individual carnivores. And I had to make up a backstory and a plot and put them in. So anyway, link spiders. And there you have it. Oh, uh, I will say this about, well, I, I, I won't actually, I was going to tell you where the word gobogeg came from. I guess if I've already talked about it so much, I got to tell you. So gobogeg, my younger brother sadly now passed away, always called me the great old bald one or gobo. And then G-E-G, -E the gag at the end of gobogeg is for green eyed games, which is the, uh, the name of the company at the time I created it. So Gobo Gag is the great old bald one of Green Eye Games, who's so kind of my stand-in, I guess. And there you have it. Now you may be angry at me because I added to Lovecraft's Deathless Canon, or you might be excited by my cool admissions. The way I see it, Lovecraft encouraged and fostered people adding to his mythology. He loved it when Clark Ashton Smith or Robert Block or Frank Belknap Long would invent things and he used them happily. He took their things like Sathagawa or the Hounds of Tindles and put them in his stories. So I like to think he would approve of me doing it too. And I'm not doing it just randomly. I'm trying to fit it in the existing worldview so we can all have the same shared worldview of hideous terrors beyond imagination. Thanks.